while we get our act together. <laughs> Welcome to Worship and Hope this morning. Will the congregation please rise for our song of welcome, They'll Know We Are Christians. Would you please join in the call of worship? If we wander from God's way out of fear or in pursuit of power, God reaches after us. If we are turned away from the places we once called home, God commands us. If we desire to create places of belonging that are just and restorative, if we go looking for what has been missing within us, God leads us in the searching. Praise be to God who leads us on paths of restoration. Would you please join in our opening prayer? Praise God for the Lord who loves. Praise God for the Lord who cares. In the midst of my weakness, when I am lost, Unable to find even myself, there is one who seeks, one who finds me. 
the lost and rejoices in the correction of our folly, rejoices with the angels, rejoices with song, rejoices for us and with us. Often before we are aware we were lost. Isn't it strange how things happen? It was just one of those days. I've decided to make a change. These are the words we use, rejoice and be glad, for that which was lost has been found. Would you be seated, please, as the children come up and join us for our children's worship? And let's sing where children belong. Good morning, everyone. You know, there is one question each of us asks ourselves every day. And that question is, what am I going to wear? Now, granted, some of us put a lot more thought into the answer to that question than others. But it's still something that each of us considers daily. Now, there are things to think about when selecting your clothes. Some of us follow fads or trends. Some of us wear pretty much the same thing every day. When I'm not in church, I like to wear jeans. But there are all kinds of jeans. For example, some have zippers, some have buttons, some are bell bottoms, some relax fit, some skinny jeans. My jeans are fairly plain. But here's a pair of my granddaughters. She likes to wear jeans, too. And and she bought them that way. (laughs) Because that's the style that she likes. Most of us want our clothes to be clean and comfortable. Well, you know the Bible doesn't tell us which shirt or jeans or dress to wear. But it does have something to say about how we, as God's children, should clothe ourselves. The Bible says we should clothe ourselves with kindness gentleness and patience and a forgiving attitude and then we should top it all off with love and the great thing about the outfit the bible describes is it fits everyone boys or girls young or old and the best thing is it never goes out of style so the next time you're trying to decide what to wear why not put on a little kindness gentleness and patience add some forgiveness, and then top it all off with love. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we are always careful in choosing what clothes to wear. Help us to be just as careful about choosing our attitudes. Amen. As you girls go back to your seats, the congregation will please rise as we sing hymn number 343, Come Back Quickly to the Lord.
Okay, a little technical problem there. Would you please be seated? Our first lesson today comes from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful people. May God add a blessing to this reading. Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Yeah, you may stand. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and places it on his shoulders. And when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me, for I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. <clears throat> so good morning. good morning. I'm Pastor Rachel. I'm not Andrew. You've already pieced this together, I'm certain. And I'm so delighted that you have welcomed me to be here this morning as part of our three-week sort of Bedford area pulpit swap. Uh, so I'm here this week. Pastor Andrew will be back next week, and then you'll get to hear from Pastor Alvis the week after that. And we have a little rotation going on. So it's very exciting for me because it's a rare gift to be able to preach somewhere that is not your sort of typical congregation. And it comes from sort of the collegiality and friendship that Andrew and Alvis and I have been able to have together. And so I hope that this is a gift to you all, as well as a true gift for me. Again, it's a really fun and special to be in a different place. Um, but part of what we have been tasked to do, part of what is so lovely and good about this kind of pulpit swap, this sharing, is that it gives us a chance to bring word from other congregations to one another. Typically, I am busy on Sunday mornings elsewhere, so I wouldn't have a chance to come talk to you or see you. And I think sometimes that means we end up more isolated than we want to or need to be. So uh, allow me just a little bit of telling you who I am and what South Haven is up to. Um, and you'll hear more about uh, what the Mennonites are up to. And my congregation, South Haven, is getting to hear what you all are doing as a congregation as well, which is really cool and unique. So I have been pastor at South Haven since 2017, and my role there at the congregation is to be a part-time pastor. I only work as a pastor 20 hours a week, and that means the rest of my time I do other things. I write about being part-time, but I also teach piano lessons, is actually my other vocation and career. Um, and it's a really joyful thing because it allows me to show up for my congregation, but also to be involved in around in the world in totally different ways as well. Um, but sometimes it's a little harder to track me down, I think, <laughs> because of that. And at South Haven, we are part of the United Church of Christ, which is a denomination that just loves to like gather all kinds of people in. 
It's a fairly new denomination in the grand scheme of things, was only founded in 1957 out of four whole denominations coming together. The Christian Congregational Reformed and Evangelical folks all got together and sort of formed a new denomination. And it kind of influences the spirit of who the UCC even is today. We're always like, who can we partner with? <laughs> who can we work with? We really like to gather together and be together. And that also means each United Church of Christ congregation is very much its own. We tend to be more different than we are alike, and that's part of what makes us who we are as a church. And here in Bedford, I would say South Haven is, like many churches, trying to figure out what's next in our life. Um, coming out of years of pandemic, looking at uh, who we are now and who God is continuing to call us to be. And so I think that's not actually, that's probably the thing we have most in common with many churches saying, it seems like there's some powerful mission and work still to be done. And so who are we now? And I can say, having been there since 2017, I never could have predicted what 2023 look, would look like, right? And so um, that's just a little bit of sort of greetings and uh, who I am and who my congregation is and I bring to you all. And if you ever have any questions or now you kind of know like, oh yeah, that's the church by the high school. Oh yeah, that's Pastor Rachel. I've seen her name on the sign. I'm just delighted to have been able to connect those dots and I'm happy to always answer more questions. And once again, thank you for having me. Thanks to Pastor Andrew for sharing the pulpit. Um, and let's take a moment and hear what God might be saying to us today um, through God's holy word. So would you first pray with me? God, open our hearts and our spirits to this time and to what you would have to say to us. I thank you for the opportunity to be here in the ways in which we recognize that your church is wide and how your welcome has always been proclaimed. Help us hear how this welcome is coming to us today. And may the message that I speak come from your spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen. We heard one story from scripture about sheep, about a shepherd, but there are many other stories that could have been told. One is this. There were two children, and they always wanted the same toy. In my mind, these two children are Clara and Emmett, my niece and nephew, who are four and one, but you can imagine the children of your choosing, because this story is universal. For recently, Clara, who is one years old, was gifted from my parents a little purse, a fuzzy, really weird kind of thing. I don't know where they found it, didn't matter. You give things to your grandchildren just because, right? And this little fuzzy purse had a tiny white stuffed cat in it. And this was the gift for Clara. Emmett got a little pumpkin, because this child loves Halloween, right? A pumpkin, great gift for this kid. Did he want the pumpkin? No. <laughs> Did he want that little fuzzy white cat? You better believe it. That little person, that little cat would get set down on the ground and moments later, Emmett would swoop in and pick it up and say, this must be for me. And everyone would try to say, well, you have your own toys. Aren't you okay? Aren't you taken care of? Don't you have what you need? Was he dissuaded? No. It was that white cat or else. And to this day, I'm pretty sure that that little white cat is living in his bedroom and not his sister's bedroom. You know this story. Even if you don't know these specific children, you have seen children. You have seen adults. And we know that that is a common story in the world of when other people have something, sometimes we want it. But what's interesting actually about the scripture story that we get is it's a lot simpler 
Today I'm introducing to you the first of three parables from Luke 15 that you will hear over these three weeks. And it kind of works out that you guys get the first one first, so take advantage of this. You get the setup, you get sort of the introduction to what Jesus is speaking to the people of God. And the story that Jesus tells is actually like a little bit simpler even than mine. He says there was a lost sheep, the sheep was found, and we should rejoice over that. That's pretty straightforward. That's not too bad. Thank goodness he didn't teach a different parable, like there was one lost sheep, they found that lost sheep, and they got rid of the 99 others. <laughs> We'd be like, ooh, <laughs> that seems like a little much, Jesus. He didn't say there was one lost sheep and only one specific person could have that sheep and that sheep was worth a million dollars and so they found it and then they hoarded it for themselves and no one else got it. He didn't say any of that. Jesus said there was one lost sheep and so the shepherd wanted to find it and so when the shepherd found it, they rejoiced and shared with that joy with those around them. Which I think leads us to another question, which is, why is this such a dramatic story? Why was this story even needed? What was Jesus trying to teach to these people that they just needed to be told that finding something that was lost was so joyful? You get a clue if you go back to who was listening to this story. So I'm going to flip back to make sure I get this exactly correct. But did you hear who was around? The tax collectors, the sinners, the Pharisees, and the legal experts. But some of these people were grumbling. And this provides the key to all of these parables. Because if no one was grumbling, this would be a very boring story. You all get a toy, you all get a sheep, everything's found, aren't you happy? <laughs> but people aren't happy as it turns out. The Pharisees are very much not happy. <laughs> they are grumbling. And this is a word, it actually specifically says what happens where people are in a group and unhappy, that they were in a crowd and they were like whispering to one another and they were just so upset and aggravated that other people were being included. Because as it turns out, they wanted things for themselves. They don't want those other people to have that nice, white, fluffy, soft cat. <laughs> it was theirs and theirs alone. And so they were grumbling. They did not want to share. And this is what Jesus begins to address in this teaching and with these parables and it leads us to a really important thing to note from all of this, which is jealousy is a joy killer. Jealousy is a joy killer. If you're more worried about what other people have, you tend not to be very happy about it. You tend to be pretty grumbly. You tend to be pretty unhappy. And so Jesus doesn't have to tell a very complicated story, but he does tell a difficult one, which it's not about finding sheep. It's about rejoicing over the sheep. It's about being okay when everyone is okay. And that is a complicated thing as it turns out for us to learn. because there was no need for the Pharisees to be grumbling. There was enough for everyone. There was no need for Emmett to take that toy. He had his own. There is no need for us sometimes to worry about who's in and out if the table is big enough for everyone. And yet, we are drawn back again and again to saying, but they should have to do it the way I did. But. What about those 99 sheep? But what about the thing I wanted? But what about the structure I had? Doesn't that matter, Jesus? Come on. 
You don't have to make this fair by bringing the one back in. You could just kick the one out. Wouldn't that be easier? And so how interesting that the master teacher, Jesus, leads us then not in this sort of path of discipleship, that this is the first story, that the first step is to get rid of this jealousy, to be done with this joy-killing mentality, to find a new way of life. He's not yet to asking for great sacrifice. He's not yet saying disciples change everything. He's looking at the Pharisees and saying, what if you try to be happy? What if you try to rejoice? What if the first step is when someone is welcomed in, you smile? What if we can celebrate together? What a powerful and really unsettling first step to take. And this is actually a point in which I want to make sure to affirm and celebrate something that your pastor is doing this morning by not standing here and instead letting me come and preach to you all. There's something so celebratory and joyful about walking away from your congregation and saying, Sounds fun. (laughs) Wherever the word comes from, that must be from God. Whoever is called back in, how joyful, how celebratory. And do you know that there are a lot of pastors who would plant their feet behind their pulpits and say, you can drag me out of here (laughs) over my dead body. And so I just want to reflect back and sort of celebrate with you what a wonderful pastor you have to have the flexibility to offer this space and what a celebration that is and how much that is at the heart of this message that we receive today in this scripture. Don't worry yet about sacrifice. Don't worry yet about everything being lined up and fair and equal. Don't worry yet about anything more complicated then if that one sheep is found, you can celebrate it. Finding that joy, letting go of the jealousy, recognizing that Jesus calls us first to this place of happiness and joy and celebration, what a gift to offer to each and every one of us. Can we rejoice when the lost are found? Thanks be to God for this word and for this message. And may we go forth in the hearing of this word. Amen. Would you please stand and join in our next hymn, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. You'll find it in our hymn book, page 381.
Please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer. Please hold in your thoughts the people of Maui and the people of the Ukraine as they face the uncertainty in their lives. Also, Keith, Holly, Dale, Lee, Sybil, Sophia, Brian, Pat, and others whose names you hold in your hearts. As Isaac offers a musical interlude, let us enter into our time of silent prayer. Loving God, your grace is like a river that flows everywhere and touches everything. Help us to live with a similar spirit. Give us the compassion to let our grace and love overflow to those who are facing hardships in their lives. It can be difficult to maneuver through this chaotic world. Help us, Lord, to turn our ears toward you and to seek the peace that you alone can give. And to remember that even when life circumstances change, you remain the same. Help us to remember that you are the God that waits at the door for us. Your grace is wide enough to encompass all our wanderings. Remind us that no matter where we go, what mistakes we make, or the many ways we might lose our way, you will always welcome us home with joy and celebration. And we thank you for a love like that. And Lord, when we come to you and our own words fail us, help us to call on the words you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing hymn 347, Spirit Strong.
At Hope, we know that the monetary offerings we make each Sunday reach out in many ways. With our giving, we provide food and clothing for those in need. We offer spiritual growth activities, maintain our building, and have a staff that helps us accomplish the task before us. Let the gifts we offer today be blessed and multiplied to help accomplish all for God's glory. Will the ushers please come forward to receive the offering? Thank you, Bill Coyer. That was lovely. Let us please stand for the doxology. Join in the unison prayer. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to give to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not with our words only, but with our whole lives. Amen. Could I actually invite you to be seated for just a brief moment? Because I'd want you to not be weary as I talk for one more moment. Uh, this is a habit I have and bring to you from my own congregation that here at the end of a, the service it's a moment to sort of share once again and wrap up before you are sent on your way. And I started doing this and left everyone standing for a while and then they'd stare at me and be like, what are you doing? Let us sit down. So this is my gift to you. Um, on the way to church this morning, I called my sister because uh, I said, we grew up in a two-point charge going between two congregations like oh, I'll be this morning, and I wanted to share that with her. And I was like, I hope I make it to the next church in time, and I haven't done this for a while. And she said, Rachel, don't worry. Your sermons are short. <laughs> 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 which is very true, which is why I sometimes like to chat a little bit at the end, because I think it gives me a chance to send you forth with a word that has been sort of in my spirit all week, sort of leading up to I've been praying for you in this congregation. My sort of affirmation and thanks for Andrew and all of you is really heartfelt. Um, this is, again, I don't think you know how unique this is. I think it's really 
more common for churches to feel in competition than in collaboration with one another. And so I take that seriously and really want to honor that. Um, and I want to honor sort of the word that comes from these parables and, you know, the beginning of this journey for you all. The cool thing is you'll hear from two other pastors who will say totally different things, <laughs> which is a real gift and very much of the parables. But the message I heard in my own spirit all week was, how can I move from grumbling to joy? How can I be joyful about the things around me instead of just frustrated when it's not exactly the way I would have done it or the life I have led or match the fairness that I want to impose, but how instead am I receiving and sharing in the joy of the Lord? So that's what I feel from you all this morning from sharing sort of the gift of being able to hear like bell choir music this morning, your sort of greeting of me, and that's what I want to sort of send you forth with. So hear this benediction, and then you can stand and sing for your closing response. But receive this. May your times of grumbling turn to joy. May the moments in which you want fairness not turn you away from compassion. May you hear the words of Jesus as deep encouragement and simultaneously deep challenge. And may you go forth with this knowing that you are surrounded by the love of your community, but also the love of God, the God who has created us, the God who has redeemed us, and the God who will sustain us each and every day of our lives. Go in peace and serve in love. Amen. I think you all tell me. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll take it.